Good morning, I'm Larry Shank, and this is the Connect and Grow Hour at Christ and Church Fraser for the date of December 27th, but we're recording this on December 22nd. We'd like to talk about the idea of after glory to God in the highest, what's happening? I would like to say I hope that all of you had a very meaningful and joyful Christmas. Since we're recording this before Christmas and we are actually uh, posting it after Christmas, I do want to try to tell you a little bit about what typically happens at our house and maybe it happens at yours as well. We have three separate celebrations that are all intermingled with each other. We have the buying and giving of gifts. In more recent years, we've sort of toned that down even more. Now, you do have to receive gifts, typically, if you uh, give them as well. But we've been reducing the number of gifts that we share, and we're frequently discovering that we don't really need a lot of things anyway, so we're sort of cutting back on that. The second piece is we have family celebrations. Unfortunately, this year with COVID, we're going to have fewer people uh, around our table when we actually have uh, our Christmas meal. But we also have an addition. We have a nine-month-old baby by the name of Ellie. It's our first grandchild. And Ellie, we expect, will be enjoying herself very much by tearing all the papers to shreds and to playing around with all of the boxes that inevitably come with gifts around the tree. The most important and the very reason why we have Christmas is that we also glory in the gift of God's Son, Jesus. And there is nothing better than living daily with a relationship with Jesus Christ. As we all know, there are ups and there are downs and there are challenges to life. And the comfort and the assurance that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior is at the very center of living a Christian life. And that is what we treasure most about Christmas. Now, what normally happens after Christmas? the gifts get put away. You don't think about exactly who gave them to you, at least in our, in our family, most of us don't think about that. And they just sort of fade away. And then we have the pictures from family celebrations, and those may bring ideas and they may bring thoughts back, but it's only occasionally. But glorying in the gift of God's Son gets bigger and bigger and bigger every day and it goes with us every day and that is what we'd like to focus on so first of all I'd like to do a flashback if I could uh, and go back to Luke chapter 1 and we see where Zechariah and Zechariah's wife Elizabeth and Mary and Joseph all receive visits from angels to give them messages. They are messages that are basically saying that there will be a child born for both of them. Obviously with Mary and Joseph, that is the baby Jesus. And for Zachariah and Zachariah's wife, Elizabeth, it is John the Baptist. Now what's happening in all of these cases is that an angel comes and delivers the message and then there are some responses from all four of these people and what we see is first of all they are glorying in the idea that God would communicate with them and that an angel would be sent then they begin then they hear the message and they they trust or have faith in the uh, messenger and the message and then finally God effectively asked whether they would partner with him in these endeavors. And in all cases, they say yes. So we're going to be seeing the ter this term of glory, trust, and partnership, or partners, uh, all the way through this particular lesson today. The second flashback is that when we go to Luke chapter 2, verse 14, it says the angels said, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his, which is God's, favor rest. So what we're having is a great big celebration, 
with angels coming, with shepherds coming, and all of this is taking place to celebrate the birth of Jesus on earth. It helps us to constantly remind ourselves that Jesus is, was, and will always be the central figure of the human race given by God to all people for all times. I'd like to sort of borrow the word glory, first of all, from this little section, and saying that there is glory to God for all of this. It's a great celebration, uh, an expression of our love and God's love toward each other. Uh, in, within the verses themselves, it says highest heavens and highest heaven. And this is where God himself dwells. And that's where the celebration rose to. It talks about the word peace. Now, peace can mean any number of things. But here in the Bible, it's, it's most of the time, and in this case, definitely here. Peace is the idea of born-again believers and God having a relationship. It is not the Roman-made peace of that particular day. There can only be one true peace, and that comes from that relationship that begins when we are born again, and we uh, work with and reside with God. The word peace, of, uh, peace also talks about the peace of mind and heart that's only possible through the Savior himself, Jesus Christ. Now we should keep in mind that the word peace also goes back to King David, Messiah, and when the Prince of Peace was talked about, it was referring to Jesus, and he was the one that brought the peace between God and man on an individual basis. But before we get too excited about the idea of peace, we also need to keep in mind that Jesus also brought conflict. You can see this in Matthew 10, 34 or James 4, 7 with the idea that peace with God does involve opposition to Satan and his works. And we'll be seeing a little more of that going forward. Now after the big celebration and people are returning to some semblance of what was daily life, we see Mary and Joseph on the eighth day presented their unnamed child to be circumcised and to be named Jesus. That's the name Jesus was actually given to Mary by the angel that talked about Jesus' birth. And the, the name Jesus to deliver his people is not a family name at all, but it actually was a name, as I mentioned earlier, that was, they were supposed to give and did not reflect the family name of Joseph. Mary and Joseph were glorying in this great event with their child. They were continuing to trust in God and they continued to partner with God. They were using the religious laws that had been provided many, many, many years before the, actually the law of Moses or the law of the Lord to guide them in their you know, rituals and also in their relationships. Mary and Joseph, 40 days after birth, uh, to fill the law of Moses or the law of the Lord, presented uh, at the temple uh, Jesus. And that was a very special event it required a five to a ten mile walk from the birthplace in Bethlehem to the temple in Jerusalem. Once again, they were following the law. They were glorying once again in this great event that they had been a part of. They were trusting that God would lead them through the law and through other, thing, other events that we're going to talk about. And they continued to partner with God. In this particular presentation at the temple, there was Simeon, a righteous and a devout man, waiting for the comfort of God through God's Messiah. God, through the Holy Spirit, had previously revealed to Simeon that before he died, he would see Jesus, the Messiah. And this is what Simeon's response was. Simeon 
took him, baby Jesus, in his arms and prayed, uh, praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. Note that this is already a recognition that Jesus has come not just to the Jews, but also to the Gentiles. He then goes on and says, and this is part of the prophecy, the child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. So what's the falling and rising referring to? Well, as Jesus continued in his ministry, there were those that were accepting and those that were rejecting Jesus. There were people that were falling in, uh, from their positions of authority or power and there were people that were rising, but more importantly, there was a falling away from following God, and there was a rising to follow God because of Jesus and his messages to the people of Israel. And the other thing it said is be spoken against. Many times Jesus was spoken against because the powers of that particular time, the political powers in particular, did not agree with the message that Jesus was bringing of love and eternal peace. Now, we also heard about the sword, and it was very painful, and turned out to be not only very painful for Jesus, but for Mary as well, as she watched her son go through the acceptance and then the rejection by so many. But in every single case, what we see here is that Simeon, who delivered this prophecy, gloried in the goodness of God, trusted in him, and was a partner with him and provided the prophecy that we just talked about. And immediately following that, the prophet Anna, or almost after, immediately afterward, who was an old widow who was about 84 years old, and she was all, also, always in the Jerusalem temple. She came up and spoke to all that were in the temple about the child Jesus and the redemption of Jerusalem through the child Jesus that turned out to be the Savior of Jesus. Once again, she gloried in, trusted in, and partnered with God. Now, we have another series of activities that were happening shortly after this. Um, Mary and Joseph did everything that was required under the law of the Lord and returned at that particular point to, the, to Nazareth in Galilee, and that's where Jesus grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom, and grace the grace of God was on him. Sometime in this sequence, we don't know exactly when, uh, after Jesus' birth, the Magi, or wise men, and, or kings from Persia, there's various ways to translate that, followed a star that ultimately led them to Jesus. When they got there, it was a, there was a house at this particular point. They bowed down and worshipped the child Jesus. They then gave uh, the child Jesus gift of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And they chose to leave by a different way so that they did not tell King Herod the location of where baby Jesus was. Now if you think about this for a minute, these people weren't just following a star. There was a message that they had received earlier. We don't know how they received it or in what form they did. But they did glory in God. They did trust in God. And ultimately, they partnered to come to worship the child, Jesus. Mary and Joseph were also constantly doing this through the life of their child, or at least the early life of their child. We don't know what actually happened to Joseph later on. Later on, an angel t actually tells Joseph to escape to Egypt to avoid the search of uh, King Herod the Great. King Herod thought himself very great, and he had no intention of allowing any challenges to who he was. And so, 
King Herod had every intent of killing the child, Jesus. So the family actually left in the middle of the night. Once again, Joseph trusted and partnered with God. And then an angel of the Lord in a dream appeared to Joseph after King Herod died and directed Joseph to return to Israel. And in a dream, Jesus, uh, and in a dream Joseph was directed to the area of Galilee and Joseph apparently chose to, really, to return to the town of Nazareth again. Once again, trusting and partnering with God. Now, if this were the end, he would probably say, I should tell you to, in your own lives, consistently glory in who God is, consistently trust in who he is, and, tr and consistently partner who he is. Well, we are at the end, and I would remind you to do that, because each of us that trust in God's goodness and willfully partners with God in faith will be born again into a life that is both joyful and centered on the will of God. We all pause for a final prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your gift of your Son, Jesus. We thank you for the ability for each of us to not only know about it, but glory in it as we think about it, as we meditate on it, and as we live each life. We ask that you'd be with us, that we would understand in such a way that we would trust, and most importantly, that we would have a partnership with you as we live our lives daily in the big things and the little things that we would always be a partner with you. We ask these things in your name. Amen.